You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I have a secret. Uh-huh. I use secret whole body deodorant because more than just my armpit stink. Uh-huh. Can I use it where my bra rubs under my... Oh, <laughs> yeah. And what about down there? You know, my... Totally. Four out of five gynecologists would recommend it. So I tried it, and now I get 72 hours of freshness from my pits to my... Ooh, I love that it's a spray. Me too. And it comes in sticks and creams too. Go get your secret whole body deodorant. This episode is brought to you by Tinder. Look, cuffing season may be over, but ladies, you can still get on Tinder and have some fun. It's the place to find whatever you're looking for, whether that's something serious, casual, or in between. Plus, Tinder has prompts and quizzes you can add to your profile to really help fuel the flame. Explore all the possibilities for yourself. Tinder, it starts with a swipe. Download Tinder today. What's up, guys? Welcome into Good Morning Lambo. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. You can email us, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. You can text us 865-658-5824. I'm joined alongside Tim, live in Green Bay. We got Carly on the line with us as well. Uh, in here to talk a little, little Packer football, but we'll also talk a little uh, NFC championship game there as that game last night got wild quick in the second half. We were live on the air going, man, looks like the Lions got this one in the bag. And uh not so fast, my friend. Um, Tim, how you doing this morning, man? Doing great. Detroit, Detroited. Yes, they did. And Dan Campbell, Dan Campbell, right? Um, there's no doubt about that. That's the big talk today is obviously the uh, going for it there on fourth down when you could have kicked a field goal to, I believe, tie it up, if I remember correctly, there uh, early, a little bit earlier in the fourth quarter if I was looking at the uh, the box score correctly. We'll hit on that in a second. Carly, how you doing this morning? I am doing all right. I'm a, kind of sad for the Lions. I was looking forward to the, you know, the story being being changed for them. I mean, they did an amazing thing this season, and it was pretty cool to watch. But I am kind of sad for how it ended there. Yeah, you know, I was I was rooting for the Lions as well. I was. Um, I say rooting, but it's one of those at the end of the game, you go, eh, couldn't happen to a better team. But at the same time, actually, it could have. It could have been the Bockings. But uh, – um, you know, when it comes to the 49ers, though, man, I was just I was so ready to blast George Kittle for saying the go pack, go the F home, you know, on the McAfee show. But uh, they pulled it out, man. You got to give them credit. And listen, I know there's still a lot of Brock Purdy slander. Um, I just don't understand it. I got to be real with you guys. And I know I'm in the minority when it comes to Packer fans. Everybody's saying he's a fraud. He ain't that good, blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean, when you look at what he did in that game, scrambling and everything, he did whatever it took to win that ball game. Um, you know, when you look at it, he was what 20 of 31 for 267. He had the interception, but he also had a touchdown. He outplayed Jared Goff just about in every statistical category, except for the you know passing yards, where I think Goff had 273, but Purdy had 267. Um, had a little bit higher uh, uh rating, passer rating at 89.0, Goff's was 88.8, and then QBR 88.1, Goff's was 59.9. Uh, then you tack that on with those just crucial runs, right? Brought pretty up five carries for 48 yards. I just don't understand it. People are like, oh, he's a fraud. He's not that good. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't get it, man. Listen, I, I hate that he's the 49ers quarterback too. I really do, and I'm gonna root against him. But at the end of the game, it's like that dude played scrappy, um, and it's something that we're gonna have to deal with in the NFC. You know, I think I think everyone would agree. Someone could, some could argue that we're the number two team in the NFC. That's just wild to me that that's actually a realistic thing that the Packers might be the second best team in the NFC. Some would say we're the first. Some would say we're the third. Right there, as long as you're in the top five in your conference, you're always going to have a shot uh, to uh, to get another championship. But I don't know, Tim. Uh, did you watch the whole game, man? Yeah, I did. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't feel bad for Detroit. So I'll have, to, <laughs> I'll have to, you know, I, I experienced firsthand the, the, the fan base and the disrespect they showed when they were in Lambeau field uh, last season. That's so I, I don't feel bad for them at all. I'll never feel bad for a division rival choking in the playoffs. Um, like I said, Detroit, Detroit, that's what they do. Um, and uh, I don't feel bad. No, not at all. I, I'll tell you what though, that has nothing to do with respect uh, and respecting yeah. what Dan Campbell and his staff did with that football team. Um, so hats off to them for a great season. They went further than we did. Um, so you have to acknowledge that. But I, I feel no, no pity, no pain for Detroit or their or their fans at all. Um, and you know, like a lot of people said last night, can can both teams lose? <laughs> like yeah. we, we we had no dog in the fight. Um, and you know, I, I'm, I guess, uh, I'm not totally alone cause I'm with, I'm with you Clayton on the, on the Brock Purdy, uh, conversation, um, say what you want about the kid being a little, little vanilla, a little plain Jane, if you will. Um, I've heard a lot of comments about him just, just being a guy, not the guy, uh, that dude played like a guy refusing to not go to the Super Bowl, And that's what you need in a, in a championship game. So, um, yeah, I don't know. He he let a comeback against us and a, and a more impressive comeback against uh, Detroit. And, you know, maybe maybe them beating Kansas City and the refs on Super Bowl Sunday will uh, will get, give his stock a little bit more rise um, going forward. But, um, yeah, yeah. got to tip your cap to uh, to the Niners. Shanahan called the hell of a game, too. Yeah. Can I be the devil's advocate here about Brock Purdy just for Absolutely. interest sake? Yes, that's so, 50 of those passing yards came off of a helmet, like, you know, the opposing team's helmet, and then his guy caught it. So do, are those yards, if you take off those 50 yards, is it still as good of a game as far as the stat line goes for him? Um, No. Because that's a lot. 50 is a lot. <laughs> obviously, it would be less yards, yeah. It's just, you know, I remember people plucking the, the same kind of stats against Brady when he was young, and then we look up years later, and it's like, how many Super Bowls has he won? Like – I don't know uh, if you're if you take into consideration plays like that, Carly. I think everything becomes really, really difficult to keep up with to keep score. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> no, so, no, I totally. Understand. I think it is worth mentioning for sure. You know, um, yeah. it's not like he played flawless. You know, by no means. I the thing that stood out to me was kind of like what Tim was saying there toward the end when he was just scrambling. It was just like there is nothing mm-hmm. downfield. I'm going to do whatever I got to do to get my team this dub. And then after, as soon as he was calm, collective the whole time, and the second it was over and he kneeled that ball, you see how fired up he was. You see Kyle Shanahan <laughs> leading him. It's like Kyle Shanahan's got his quarterback, uh, just like we've got ours. But um, I don't know. It was it was a fun game to watch, though, watching the comeback and everything. Um, the thing that stood out to me – well, let's go to the chat here real quick. Donovan Schilling said they said they were winning the Super Bowl. The lie detector test determined they were lying, L-I-O-N. I see what you did there. I see what you did there. And then Ron Sample said, I just read that Lions kicker 75% on 40 to 49 yards and 45% on 50 plus. I don't know if it's accurate, but it could be a reason for the decisions. Could be. Um, they had the ball at – let me look at the the uh, box mm-hmm. score here, the play-by-play. I'm trying to think over that. I thought they were at the 30, if I remember right. Um, let's I just- see. Yeah, and so they've they, only had that kicker for like four games, I think, right? Like they've definitely had a kicker problem over the season, I think. Yeah. Here's another game we're trying – let's let's put it all on the field goal kicker. Let's put it, let's put it all on the coach for not sending the, the kicker out. But but nobody's talking about Detroit's defense getting dog-walked in the second half of that game. So, yeah. you know, I, I mean – hey, Aaron Glenn's not going to get head coaching job. <laughs> yeah, and it, I mean, it's tough to argue with the with the logic when you lose by three points, right? You know, you got to think you, you passed on two field goals. Do you win that game by three points if you take those field goals? I mean – the right. world may never know, but um, again, it doesn't explain your your defense, which has been, you know, pretty stout this year. It, they just they just kind of folded, you know. Yeah, um, they did have the ball at the thirty when they decided to go for it on fourth and three. So you tack on the ten for the end zone. That's forty plus the seven for the setback. So that would have been a forty-seven yarder. So yeah, not a um, gimme by any means, right? But if you look at the statistics that uh, that he just showed here. You were saying that, yeah, 75% of the times he hits that kick. I'm kicking the field goal there. I'm so sick of this. I'm just going to be real for a second. I'm so sick of the analytics. 
Brandon Staley was the one leading the charge with this whole, you got to be aggressive and go for it on fourth down. What did it get him? How many freaking games this year as Packer fans did we see a situation where it's like, Matt, if you had just taken the points. Yeah, analytics are ruining the game. They they really are. (laughs) And and here's the thing that Michael Lombardi talks about and other old football heads that people call dinosaurs and make fun of, but that analytics does not factor in the momentum of the game. Analytics doesn't factor in that the three of the five plays that's on your play call sheet in a fourth and short situation, they have done an excellent job shutting down all the way throughout the game because you understand those plays could end up in a in a second and short or a third and short scenario too. Those are your favorite plays in short down distance. They don't take those things into consideration to just look at the analytics and go, okay, forget who's healthy on the field right here at this specific moment. It doesn't take that into consideration either. I don't know if Greenlaw came back, but let's just use that as an example. What if Greenlaw, one of their best linebackers, isn't on the field in that specific, specific situation? And you're going to lean on the analytics that suggests you should go for it or should not go for it, not even knowing who's on the field. The analytics doesn't understand all of those aspects to the momentum of the game. And when you mention that, when you know you being Michael Lombardi, these analytics geeks are just, oh, they, what a dinosaur. That's why you're not in the league. Okay, okay. And that's why – Dan Campbell was holding back tears at the podium. And I know he would do it again. There's no doubt about that. But if Bill Belichick, if Bill Belichick had decided to go for it instead of kick all those field goals all those years, he'd probably have half the rings he's got, to be honest with you. I think that's the difference, me personally. So those, those are the same people that bury their head in stat sheets and analytics and they don't even watch they don't even watch football really. Right. They're just they're just looking at numbers and you know, those are great analytics, data, all of these metrics. They're great for when you're putting together a game plan, when you're looking at, you know, post game, what did we miss? What did we do? Well, they can help a coaching staff. They can help players understand what's happening on the field. But if you're going to sit there and, and like, you know, root your game calls and your, and everything that's happening, like you said, momentum, things that are going on on the field, you had a little bit of rain, you know, all these things that, right. that happen, it can bite you. It really can. But um, I, I think it's live by the gun, die by the gun. Dan Campbell's been this way all year. You knew what time it was. They were going to they were going to go one one speed foot on the gas. It didn't surprise me that he went for it twice. It really oh, didn't. No, not at all. Not as soon as the situation was it, it dropped. I went, oh, he's going. Think about this too. remember the Cowboys game with the controversial uh, illegal man downfield, all that. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Remember, he went for mm-hmm. it, got it, went for it again. I think got it. There's two penalties mm-hmm. called and then decided to go for it a third time. And it's like that cost him that game. And people yeah. say, no, it was the refs that cost him the game. BS. Like the refs are go- – I think we would all agree the refs are going to make mistakes. How like, many how many signs do you need to just kick the freaking extra point? <laughs> right. It's just wild, man. Um, how uh, – I don't know. I And, again, I know I'm old-fashioned, but take the freaking points. You take the points in that situation and you put the pressure back on the other team. Like, you know, if you if you kick the point there or kick the kick the field goal fourth and three, if you miss it, you know what? OK, we tried. You know what I mean? It is what it is. This whole just got to go, just got to go, just got to go. If you kick that field goal, if I'm looking at the score correctly. What is that? <laughs> that <Yeah>. music playing? <laughs> I don't hear it. What, what do you got going? They get, they're getting an ad in here. All right. It was uh, what were we promoting right there? Let's see. Some kind of car. Cool. I think it's Alexis. <laughs> I, Alexis. All right, go get I wasn't Alexis. hearing it either. It was just on my end. I was like, what in the world? So in that situation, if you if you just kick the field goal, right, um, and you tie it up, there's how much time left in the game? Nine minutes left in the game, if I'm looking at that correctly. Let's see. No, seven, 7.32 left. You tie it up. Now you put the pressure back on San Francisco and Brock Purdy. Instead, right, what do you do? You go for it on fourth down. You give them the ball back. They go right down the field and score a touchdown. That's, that's literally a 10-point swing, yep. and then you you wonder why you lost the game. You go back down, score another touchdown, right, to put it within three, and then, of course, you gotta you got to depend on an onside kick. I don't know. That's an example of putting pressure on your defense. You know, your offense is coming down there. They're not getting points, you know, or your coach is not taking – you know, not attempting to take the, the little three points, which mm-hmm. are so freaking valuable in playoff football. You sure. take the points. It's playoffs. There is no next week if you lose – you need points on the board. That's kind of, I'm not going to say demoralizing, but it doesn't help your defense when they all got to trot out there on the field and go, okay, uh, let's get a stop here and hopefully give our offense another chance. And, um, you know, you can't do that. That's not complimentary football. But, um, you know, hey, there, 
it's real easy for us to sit here on Monday morning and criticize, you know, Dan Campbell. And I'm, I'm not willing to do that. Like I said, I, I can't stand Detroit and their fans, but I got a lot of respect for their, their coach and their staff and, uh, and a handful of the players on that team. So um, I don't think it's fair to put it all on, on Dan Campbell. They lost as a team. They did. Right. And that's, yeah, that's in no way am I, am I saying that it's just, I, I just don't, I don't get, I don't understand how, how many times it's got to happen across the league before someone goes, maybe we should rein this in just a, touch. Just a bit. <laughs> Jeff Silky in the chat says, not to mention Clayton, when going before it fails, it hands the momentum back to the other team. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. You know, my, I'm all for it on uh, – you miss on – or you're going for it on fourth and goal, you get stuffed, and now, you're, now your opponent's got to go 99 yeah. yards. Okay. And you're putting them on the three-yard line or the yeah. two-yard line, and you, and you know their goal is the first two downs are probably running the ball. So yeah. you're taking a chance of them making a huge mistake, a safety, a sack, a fumble, a strip, a strip fumble, an interception, trying to force it on third down to get you some space to punt. There's a lot more things can go right there. It's just this whole, I don't know. Um, but it, it did lead to the onside kick. Carly, did you have did you have a comment or a question or something about onside kick? I do, but just for, for Tim, I just I just want to hit this because this is what happened after the Lions lost the game. Oh no! You suck again! <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, so did I you see? A... Um, oh, uh, oh, I forgot who tweeted it, but it was great. Somebody tweeted last night. They said, "Show me Ford Field now, you cowards!" <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> they were showing the the fan watch party like all afternoon, all evening. Yeah, what's then, it looking like now? Once they caught that L, they didn't show it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Go ahead, Carl. So my question, and this Tim will be, you maybe you'll have something to say, is about like technique or strategy for onside kick because my husband actually I have to credit him he had this idea as far as like making the onside kick just a more viable option because I think it's maybe been what two or four onside kicks that have been you know actually recovered this year by the kicking team so his idea was what if you have a find a really like a soccer player or some really accurate kicker that can just put it wherever they want and then just basically kick it as hard as they can in a straight line straight at the opposing team whoever's lined up right there and just literally try and bounce it off them if (laughs) that would give them a better chance of recovering it because then you get that you get that touch from the other team and then it's coming back your way so it's headed towards you I don't know what do you guys think that's definitely it's definitely a strategy right Tim people have done it before they have but I mean we have to remember that the competition committee has they're they're trying to remove that from the game i mean they've ruined it was already very difficult to (laughs) recover an onside kick and now you got guys that can't move you know until the ball's kicked the the rules are a little different i do agree with uh with the logic because i think what we've seen now is uh rather than the ball being placed on the tee vertically if you notice that's what they tried to do they they did a a classic onside kick you know you place the ball straight up and down on that tee the kicker is going to kick the top of that ball, you get an end over end and a high bounce and you're hoping you get uh, a recovery. Those don't work anymore in the NFL. It, it, it just, it does not work. The ones that have more success are similar to what you suggested. I've also seen where the ball sideways horizontally placed on the yeah. tee and the kicker is going to go soccer style and basically spin that thing like a top yeah. and hope it goes 10 yards and you can get, get it to fall. Um, but yeah, I've seen that a few times. The the idea that let's just kick it off this, you know, this big tight end or whoever they got on the line here, and see if he'll, uh, you know, touch the ball, and then uh, we'll get a play at it. But I I believe you can look back. I mean, at the metrics and the analytics, onside kick recoveries have got to be down significantly uh, in the last couple of seasons since we've had the the recent rule changes on kickoffs. Um, but I agree. I think uh, you've got to get creative. Um, the thing that kind of screwed Detroit was uh, him, you know, the illegal touching, obviously. It's kind of hard to time that when you're just trying to recover the ball. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's tricky, man. The, the onside kick is all like it's going to be rare when you see one recovered. And usually it is. It's something like that contact by the receiving team and then the ball pops loose and now it's live ball and you can you can recover it. But I always say the key is don't don't put yourself in a situation where you need that. Because it ain't gonna happen, right? That's the big thing. We got a uh, breaking news. It, it kind of applies to the Packers, but it's uh, it's more about the Lions. So we just talked about you know Ben Johnson and some of these other coach or um, Aaron Glenn and some of these other coaches. Um, 
I believe someone said Aaron Glenn's interviewing for a job today, but um, this is from Tom Pelissero on Good Morning Football just a second ago. said, a busy 48 hours ahead for the Lions offensive coordinator Ben Johnson and Ravens D.C. Mike McDonald, uh, who are scheduled to interview for both remaining head coaching vacancies. So Ben Johnson from the Det- Detroit Lions, their OC, and the Ravens D.C. Mike McDonald are scheduled to interview uh, both of those Ravens DC yeah. is interviewing for a head coaching job. Oh, uh, yes, that is correct. So, so much for the, so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, when that happens, right, let's say he does get a job and I'm, I'm not saying he will, but let's say Mike McDonald does get a job somewhere. What you're going to see the Ravens do now is they're going to sit back and go, okay, who's getting the most attention on our staff, right? And they're going to protect those guys. That's exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to share the screen here, and let's just go to their coaching roster one more time. And uh, I know we talked about it in a past podcast, but when you look at their coaching staff, we'll go full screen here for just a second. Let me get that off there. Um, by the way, number one Packer fan says, Dan Campbell, victim of too much diesel. Love it. But as far as the onside kick. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's us days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Skinny Pop Popcorn. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Oh, so light and crunchy. Skinny Pop Original Popcorn is the snack you've been searching for. Made with just three simple ingredients, popcorn kernels, sunflower oil, and salt. Snacking never felt or tasted so good. Perfectly popped, endlessly delicious. Give yourself permission to snack and pick up Skinny Pop Original Popcorn today. This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. We got another day of NBA action. And with FanDuel, every night is a watch party. So it's time for your FanDuel crew to make their bets. So, what's the move tonight, gang? You know that new customers who bet $5 get $200 back in bonus bets if you win. Woohoo! We're heating up, fam. Bet all the stars with all your friends and make every moment more only on FanDuel. New customers bet $5, get $200 back in bonus bets if you win. Make every moment more with FanDuel. It goes down in the field. It goes down. It goes down in the field. 21 plus and present in Iowa. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See full terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-BETS-OFF. The only thing I'll add on to that um, is if you try to kick it straight, Carly, um, a football is much, much harder to kick in a straight line on a line drive trajectory than a soccer ball. So, it, it, you know, it's it's not a slam dunk, although you you get them lined up in an onside kick set there, it'd be a little easier to hit that cluster of people, right? Um, just, I mean, just try to smack them right in the chest with it, right? There's been people that's done that in the past. There's also been kickers that they noticed that as soon as they go to kick off, one of the front guys on the return team would immediately turn their back and sprint backwards. They would aim at their back and hit them in the back. I've seen that one too. But uh, yeah, you know it's what just else a- is, is cool too is sometimes you'll see the kicker approach like he's going to kick it, you know, to the top of your screen or like, you know, he's going to kick one side and then at the mm-hmm. last second he'll turn soccer style and kick it to the bottom side. Right. That can kind of give you a little of deception and maybe give you a more of a chance to recover, but Clayton's right, man. Like kicking a football is a crapshoot every time. Anyone who can do it with any kind of control is extremely talented. I mean, think about it. Out of everybody on the face of the earth, 
the NFL can't find 32 people that can do it well. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, think about that. There's when I say, well, like every year you, I, th- I feel really comfortable saying there's not 10 kickers in the league that you go, Oh yeah, that's a gimme there. You know what I mean? You might have right. three, maybe four that you go, yes, they're going to, I mean, they are just, it's going to be very rare. They miss a field goal. Just wild that all the people on the, on this ball of mud spinning through space, if you believe that, key up the conspiracy music. I know there's some flat earthers out there. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anyone who uh, anyone who you, it's all you can find is just three or four that can do it that well is just absolutely wild to me. So um, anyway, so if Mike McDonald does get a head coaching job, okay, let's just take a look real quick here. There's Mike Mac McDonald. You can see my cursor, right, Tim? Yep. <clears throat> All right. So there's Mike McDonald. Okay. Everyone else on that staff, obviously Chris Horton, special teams coordinator. You got Todd Monken, um, Todd Monken, I should say, offensive coordinator. You got their assistant head coach, D line coach, Anthony Weaver. I'm I'm seeing some people say the Packers should go after Anthony Weaver, 12 years experience. Uh, maybe that's not a rule, or maybe they don't know that it's a rule that it would be a lateral, it would, you know, it would be a lateral move. With him being assistant head coach, we would have to make him assistant head coach in Green Bay, I thought. Maybe that's not the case. But nonetheless, they'll probably look to promote him to D.C. So if you're the Baltimore Ravens and Mike McDonald does get a job, let's just to say he did get a head coaching job, right, then you've got a decision to make. Do we leave Anthony Weaver where he's at and risk losing him, right? Do we go down to our top candidates, which were Chris Hewitt, Right here, right? Chris Hewitt, their special or their uh, passing game coordinator, secondary coach, or Denard Wilson, find him again down here. He's their D back coach, okay? 12 years experience. You got those three guys, in my opinion, that I think are going to kind of get a lot of attention. So let's say, let's say Anthony Weaver gets one interview for DC, right? Let's say that Chris Hewitt gets three interviews for DC and Denard Wilson only gets one. As a coaching staff, you've got to decide, all right, who do I who do I want to protect here? He's getting more attention, right? So maybe you go just go ahead and promote him to DC to block that move. That way you keep all three of them intact. You can see how it becomes a little bit of a cat and mouse game. You also probably look at it a little bit, a little simpler from a head coaching position and go, who's the best guy? Who's the guy most qualified for the job? Let's just go ahead and promote him right now. You know what I mean? That's probably the way they'll approach it. But the, these kind of conversations are going to heat up now with all the uh, all the coaching talk for sure. But um, what do you think about that, Tim? Do you think Mike McDonald actually has a chance to get a head coaching job somewhere? See, that's tough. That's what I was just going to say. Like, you know, they're, interviewing is great, and we talked about that, right? There's certainly an intent for a team to take you serious um, as a candidate if they're calling you in for an interview. But that's not a slam dunk. You know, some guys are great – great at the job, but they're terrible in an interview. So you never know. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about him. You know, if he chokes in the interview, that could be the end. Um, But he could be a Matt LaFleur and be super prepared and knock it out of the park and get a job. So, yeah, I don't know. I think time will tell, but I think it would be more interesting if he doesn't get a head coaching job to see what happens now, you know, with that staff and what what they're going to do. Will he return, you know, as the D.C.? If he goes and, uh, you know, looks to see if the grass is greener and then finds out it's not um, what happens in Baltimore. Um, But I'm with you. I like um, uh, Chris Hewitt uh, for sure. It has been one of my faves. Um, But, yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about uh, Mike McDonald, but I will tell you, I mean, nine years in the league, he's a D.C. uh, Baltimore stout defense this year, last couple of years. I mean, you got to think he's a serious candidate, right? Yeah, and it looks like 15 hours ago, Tom Pelissero reported the Seahawks can now interview Ravens D.C. Mike McDonald for their head coaching job this week. The commanders are scheduled to conduct a second interview Monday with associate head coach. I don't know if he meant assistant head coach, but associate head coach, defensive line coach Anthony Weaver for their head coaching job. So the commanders are setting up a second interview that it's already set up with Anthony Weaver today. So as their potential head coaching, uh, yeah, head coaching job. So, wow. Yeah, sounds like he's probably the front runner, Anthony Weaver, as far as the coach on this staff to get a head coaching job. So let's say Mike McDonald does get hired out. Anthony Weaver gets hired out. That would be wild 
if yeah. those both of those guys got hired as the next two head coaches, especially with them being defensive coaches. So now you're looking at which one of these defensive coaches is going to get promoted to head coach. Is it going to be Chris Hewitt? You know, is it going to be uh, uh, Denard Wilson? Who would it be, you know, and uh, who would be the assistant coach as well? So I'm um, going to be interesting. There's going to be a lot of pieces fall into place today. I really believe that. I'm going to comb through – Ian Rappaport real quick here and see if he's got anything else to add. Um, former Browns OC Alex Van Pelt is heading to Tampa to interview for the vacant Bucks OC job today, sources said. He's also still in play uh, in Las Vegas for Raiders OC. You guys remember, if I remember correctly, Alex Van Pelt was an assistant here in Green Bay. That was the one that Aaron Rodgers got extremely upset when they, they let him go. I think they just cut him loose that year. And he was he was pissed off about that. I remember that. that. That's the thing too about Aaron getting mad over the players not being brought back. There's also coaches and things like that that happened over the years too that he disagreed with. But um, Alex Van Pelt at the time was one of the highly touted names. And obviously, yeah, he's yeah. fizzled out a little bit. But um, yeah, so that's kind of how it looks on the coaching coaching front as it sits right now. It says um, the Commanders and Seahawks can hire Ben Johnson, Aaron Glenn, Anthony Weaver, and Mike McDonald if if they so choose a coaching carousel set to end uh, before the Super Bowl. So there's a good chance those two head coaching vacancies get filled even before the Super Bowl, and it sounds like some of the front runners, like I said, Ben Johnson, Aaron Glenn, Aaron Glenn being the D.C. in Detroit, which I don't see him as – I don't know. I don't see him as a top candidate, me personally. It just all the all the games that you seen Detroit struggle with this year. It seems like people were able to score. Maybe that's just me remembering back to Thanksgiving Day when we just dog walked our defense uh, the entire game. But good did reason. we get a confirmation on Pete Carroll yet with uh, Seattle? Is he going to stay on as a advisor? It's it's funny you bring that up because it is such a weird situation, Tim. Um, we kind of talked about it um, a little bit earlier, and we and we we steered away from it. So essentially, what happened was. You know, it said that they mutually agreed for him to go up to the front office, right? And it was like, oh, okay, cool. So he's just, you know, he's he's getting, you know, he's in his 70s, obviously. He's just going to kind of step aside and go to the front office. This is a mutual thing. And then he got interviewed right after it. And he said, I competed for the job. And we were like, what, competed? what are you talking about? So he was in there trying to say, hey, look, you know. I, I want to keep this job. So it wasn't just that we mutually agreed. It was more of them going, hey, look, you're not the head coach anymore. We'd like to keep you on staff, but we're not going to let you be head coach anymore. So the problem with him is it kind of lines up with Bill Belichick. Like what organization is going to hire someone in that's in their 70s to in, you know, one, two, maybe three years, they're going to step aside and you got to go through this whole process again unless they bring someone with them. And that's why with, with Bill Belichick, at least he brings Steven with him. And you right. can kind of expect Steven to, to rise to that. I'll tell you one thing, though. Pete Carroll is uh, the youngest 70-year-old man on oh, earth. No if, there was, if there was a guy, you know, in his 70s that you might take a take a crack at and, and let, him, let him finish out his coaching career, it's probably Pete Carroll. Um, but I think there in, in Seattle, that might have just been, um, what's the word I'm looking at? Not a formality, but just you know, the organization trying to do right by Pete Carroll saying, you know, Hey, we want to move on from you as head coach, but we're not, we're not booting you out of the building. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Pretty interesting. I guess we'll see. Do you see him possibly going somewhere else? If that doesn't, doesn't pan out. You're talking about Pete Carroll. Yeah. I don't. Uh, well, I mean, I could see him going somewhere else if, if Seattle ticked them off that much, you know, um, right. I don't see a scenario where he's going to be a head coach anywhere. I just don't, man. Um, I could be wrong, you know, but obviously there's only two two spots. Nobody's interviewed for him, so it's yeah. kind of like with Belichick. Belichick it, it heated up there in Atlanta, but I think Belichick went in there, and, and Michael Lombardi done a great job breaking it down the other day. Whether you agree with him or not, I think he brings up some really interesting points. Bill Belichick goes in there and goes, you've got all these people in place around Arthur Blank that are telling him, Here, here's how we build this team. Well, they've been telling him that for years now and they keep falling flat on their face, then you got the guy who's won the most Super Bowls in, in NFL history comes in and says, all right, yeah, we would have to scrap this down. And, our, and uh, you know, uh, uh, gosh, what's his name? I just had it. Uh, Arthur Blank. Golly, drawing the blank. He he comes back and, and kind of is like, oh, no, I like my I like my guys around me. And, and what Lombardi said, it, it happens all across the league. They're protecting their desk. They know – if Bill Belichick, all these advisors, right, these evaluators that work for Arthur Blank and other owners, they they know if Bill Belichick comes in, he's cleaning the house. So what are they telling Arthur Blank? 
Yep. Oh, I don't think this is the right move for us. <laughs> They're protecting their desk. So yep. um, that's the cat and mouse game and the business side of pro football that I absolutely love. Mace Taggart in the chat. Thank you so much for the super chat. But he says, morning, Clayton. Go Pack Go. Love is the answer. Love is the answer. I'm so excited about it. Um, I'm going back through my tweets from the year and the top <laughs> plays that I tweeted in real time, and I'm retweeting them so we can kind of relive them. And what I'm going to do is try to pick out a handful of plays, and we're going to do a chalk talk from plays of the year. That will be a lot of fun. And I thought we could just pull it from our old chalk talk segments, but also I think it would be cool just to break it down uh, fresh again. We may we may have both versions. But, yes, love is the answer, Mace. Appreciate the super chat, buddy. Thank you so much. It's my quarterback. Jen Wright says, wasn't he a – Quarterback coach in Green Bay talking about Van Pelt, I'm pretty sure. Yes, he was. And mm -hmm. he's the one that Rodgers just – it was one of his favorite coaches, you know. Um, so, that's 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 the thing that, again, I, it just you kind of playing devil's advocate. When you look at – I was always of the opinion that shut up, play ball, let them decide on the coaches, right? That was how I always felt. But then when I hear Peyton Manning talk about how ridiculous it is that Aaron Rodgers – doesn't have any kind of say in the personnel or anything else. Um, that's when I got to step back and go, okay, this is one of the greatest all time quarterbacks who's saying, no, this is wrong to think like this. Maybe me as a fan, I need to step back for a second. And go, Ugh. Tom Brady did the same thing, right? Tom Brady wanted more say. He leaves, goes, wins another Super Bowl. I think we got to say he was right. <laughs> right. So you got two different scenarios where Peyton, Peyton was cutting people off the practice or off the practice field. Get yeah. him out of here. I don't want him on the roster. Like he's hit that happened. Pat McAfee told that story. Multiple uh Adam Benatari told that story. Multiple people told that story. That Peyton was cutting people off the roster around the field. Rogers never went to that, that level, but he was, you know, kind of like over the years, coaches, players got plucked off that roster without even saying, Hey, what do you think about this move? I don't think Rogers should have final say, but yeah, to agreed. just to just go behind him though and be like, oh, we don't need to hear from you. That that was a little bit like, hmm, after I hear Peyton and all these guys talk about it. So I think you're right. You say input, right? Yeah. A quarterback like that, top tier, you know, first ballot Hall of Fame level talent, you're gonna wanna get some input from that guy. But you're also gonna want to make it abundantly clear that you're not the GM and you're not you're not the head coach of this football team. So you can have all the input you want. At the end of the day, the organization is going to make a decision. And I think as long as that line is there and it's not not blurred or crossed, mm -hmm. um, you could have a really good relationship with a franchise QB who is in these meetings and is talking about personnel. And, you know, his input is not going in one ear out the other. It's being seriously considered. But at the end of the day, it, it you know. I don't think we should have our guy out there, you know, cutting personnel. On the no, not at all. Not at all. it's not a good look. So, um, but yeah, man, I think, you know, top tier quarterbacks deserve that, especially guys with long tenure in the league, you know, that have seen so many different players come and go. Uh, they may have a pretty good eye on talent, you know, so I think you got to take their input and take it seriously. Yeah. And, and again, everything, the pendulum always swings to the extreme opposite right you got people that they should get absolutely no input you got others that say they should just shut up and let him be gm and it's like i don't agree with either of those it's just my it is mind-boggling that they they literally just pretended like he didn't exist when it came to you know making signings and stuff and yeah so there you go um so anyway that's uh that's a little bit of coaching talk i was going to kind of dive into the detroit lions coaching staff too here i guess we could do it just to take a quick glance and let's just see because that's one we haven't looked at will we be interested in any of the lines defensive coaches and let's just see if any of these names kind of pop to you guys to me none of them did and i'll try to get it zoomed in here enough where you guys can actually see this let's uh let's just take a quick glance at their defensive side of the ball all right defensive coordinator aaron glenn he's got a little bit of a little bit of praise right can you see this okay tim yep all right cool um, he's got a little bit of praise, obviously, uh, Aaron Glenn. I, again, I, I I haven't felt like that's a strength of their team. Maybe we should pull up the metrics. I've got them pulled up too, just to see where they rank. Defensive quality control. You got Wayne Blair. You got cornerbacks Dre Bly. He obviously played in the league. Defensive assistant, outside linebackers, uh, David Correll. Maybe is how you say it. Uh, assistant defensive line Cameron Davis. Uh, you got defensive backs Brian Duker. 
You've got a uh, defensive line coach, John Scott Jr., Sean Dion Hamilton, assistant linebackers. You got John Fox. Look at old John Fox, senior defensive assistant. You know, someone mentioned that about Bill Belichick. What, what do you guys think about that? I want to hear, and Carly, you speak up at any point. I know you're you're busy over there too, but if you've, if you've got anything to say, you just speak over us, okay? But uh, um, someone said, what about bringing Belichick in as a, a senior assistant? I think that would be an awesome move, me personally. Would he be willing to do it? He may. You see many coaches do that. They take a year off if they didn't get a head coaching job that they wanted or just the stars didn't align, and they'll go in and be like a senior advisor. That might be a role that he would be interested in, you know? Um, that would be kind of cool. But uh, John Fox, senior defensive assistant, obviously has a ton of experience. Uh, linebacker coach Kevin Shepard and then Dre Thompson, the WCF minority coaching assistant defensive quality control there. So um, I don't really see anything there that catches my attention, Tim. I mean, Aaron Glenn's obviously the biggest name that we've heard of. But anybody there that kind of piques your interest, like I said, John Fox probably got the most experience of everyone. But. Yeah, um, and I don't see John Fox. You know, he's been a head coach. He's um, been a DC, I believe. Is that mm -hmm. true? So you know, oh he's, yeah, he's, he's been head the, coach too. Yeah, yeah, he's head ran coach. the gamut as far as experiences, and that guy's probably on the, you know, his last hurrah swan song years of uh, his coaching. So I don't know if he, right, he wants to go be the dude again somewhere. But um, yeah, you know, you look at a guy like that. I, I don't see anyone else here that's super exciting as yeah. far as uh you know adding to our staff um, i agree i completely agree and now let's do this let's let's just make sure we're we're not overlooking anything let's look at the team statistics okay um and and just kind of see where detroit ranked because i feel like their defense isn't as good as some give them credit right and you guys just enjoy the free advertising here okay as we uh promote direct auto now so um here we go let's kind of dive in here this is opponent Points per play. Can you see that okay, Tim? Is it yep. on the screen yet? All right, good deal. Good deal. Let me go ahead. Let's, go. Uh, we're going to take Drew's comment down here for yeah. – well, I was Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. So when you look at the team statistics as far as opponents' points per play, where does Detroit land? Woo, 28th in points per play. Right? Hello. Yeah, not, not a good look there. Make sure it's sorted correctly. It is. So now let's go – to scoring defense points per game just to make sure there's not little immediate outlier. Actually, I did points per play again. Let's go again here um, as the ads take over. You love it. Absolutely love it. Scoring defense, opponent, opponent points per game. It should be somewhere around the same ranking there. Um, yeah, 25th. So they climbed a little bit in points per game. I, I always take points per play over points per game. That's just me personally. Uh, because if you do turn the ball over inside your 20 or whatever, and it takes them three plays to score rather than just one, I think that's worth mentioning, you know, um, just every little statistic you can get. So horrible in scoring defense or some people going, that's not important. Okay, let's talk about rushing. All right, let's go to yards per rush attempt, opponent yards Per rush attempt. Uh, let's see where Detroit lands here. Did I pass them up? I must have. So they're eighth in rush defense as far as yards per attempt. To me, that's that's the metric you want to look at. You know, like how many yards are they getting per attempt? So they're eighth best in that. So they're a solid top 10 run defense in that regard. Let's go to passing, which we know that's, that's all the rage right now. Um, let's go to yards per pass attempt allowed by their defense, um, yeah, 30th in yards per pass attempt. So, And you kind of seen it last night too, right? Um, you know, we talked about the the helmet the helmet play, right, Carly? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that plays I into it too, it. but it's like when you're 30th. Make your next move with American Express Business Platinum. You'll get five times membership rewards points on flights and prepaid hotels booked on amextravel.com. Plus, enjoy access to the American Express Global Lounge Collection. And with the welcome offer of 120,000 points, your business can soar to all new heights. Terms apply. Learn more at americanexpress.com slash business dash platinum. Amex Business Platinum, built for business by American Express. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Allstate wants to remind fans that mayhem is everywhere, like at your pregame barbecue. While you prep your meats, that grease trap you forgot to empty is prepping to smoke your porch, garage, and the car inside. 
And without the right home and auto insurance coverage, the cost to repair this could eat up your savings. So bundle home and auto with Allstate to save and get protected from mayhem like this. Bundled savings vary and are not available in every state. Coverage is subject to policy terms and conditions. This episode is brought to you by J. Crew. This spring, J. Crew is telling a linen love story. From perfectly rumpled beach cover-ups and effortlessly sexy suiting to button-up shirts from the world-famous Baird McNutt Mill in Ireland, the new J. Crew collection is made to be shared, lived in, and loved for decades and generations to come. Shop linen like you've never seen it. And more new arrivals for spring 2024 at jcrew.com. Life is full of things to manage. Your work, your family, your plans, and your treatment. Consider Kesimpta, Ofatumumab 20 milligram injection. You can take it yourself from the comfort of home. If you're ready for something different, ask your healthcare provider about Kesimpta and check out the details at kesimpta.com. Brought to you by Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation. In allowing how many yards you allow uh, per pass attempt, not a good look. I don't want anybody from that staff. That's just me personally. I just don't see it. Because, like, like when you go back to the top, look at the teams we're talking about. Baltimore, Kansas City. You know, the Jets were really good at stopping the pass, right? Cleveland, San Francisco is one we've talked about a lot. New England, you guys, you know, I've talked about them a lot. New England, 6.2, right? And they're, uh, let's see, eighth. It's wild that we didn't interview anyone from them, all right? Let's go to their rush defense real quick just to see how good New England was at stopping the run. Look at that. Very top of the list, yards per carry. So it's just wild that more people aren't getting hired out of that New England defensive room. It really is. But uh, anything stick out to you there, Tim, as far as, uh, you know, any any uh, anybody on Detroit? I just I think that pretty much solidifies it. I'm not interested in anyone from Detroit. Yeah, me too. And I'm with you. I'm, I'd go to I'd be trying to pilfer New England staff before <laughs> before going to Detroit. So, yeah. Definitely. You know, their scoring defense wasn't as good, but that's where you got to put things into perspective and go, okay, their offense was was historically bad, right? So those do come into play. Um, that's why when I look at Green Bay's defense and we finish right around the top 10 in, in scoring defense, and then you turn around and you go, okay, every other metric, they're kind of sitting there somewhere, you know, like a, against the run. I should have looked that up. Actually, I won't share the screen again, but if I were to go to per rush attempt, right – Green Bay is sitting at 24th, obviously not good. But still, there's, what, eight other teams that are worse than them stopping the run, and we know that's uh, that's kind of on the back burner in today's defense. Let's see what their passing defense was. Let's see if it's as bad as people kind of made it out to be. Yards per pass attempt, Green Bay finished 18th. So you got a top-10 scoring defense. You're 18th in stopping the pass, and you're right around 20th or whatever it was, 24th in, uh, in stopping the run. You can definitely get better, but you got to be careful too, because when you look on this list, and and you know, I know that Christian Parker is the one who's kind of emerged stopping the past. They were 27th, right? I mean, there was all kinds of metrics they were bad at. They were 27th, uh, rush defense, yards per rush attempt. Um, Denver was and you don't have that on the screen, Clayton. Just letting you know if you were gonna show it. Right. Yeah. I'll just read them all. Okay. Denver was dead last in yards per rush attempt. Dead last. So this whole notion that, yeah, let's just get a new guy in here. Joe Barry's the problem. You got to be careful. We got to be careful of that. That's why I'm like, why are we not looking at New England's defense closer, right? And then he, some people are probably saying, Clayton, you, know, you were big on, you know, scoring defense. That was your big thing all year, and, and I agree. It's, I think it's the most important aspect, me personally. I know, I know many people disagree, but if you go to look at Denver's scoring defense, they're 26th. So there's nothing really there. We look at the PFF grades. The PFF grades suggest they've underperformed. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know, man. It's just a it's a weird hire. But again, it was a weird hire for Matt Lafleur too, right? Right. So. And the, right. the so moment. Can I, can, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask, yeah, question about the Lions' um, defense and not hiring anyone from them since our seemingly a lot of our draft picks and a lot of our guys just kind of lean more naturally to being better at stopping the pass. Wouldn't we maybe consider taking someone from a defense that is so good at stopping the run since that's kind of where we've sucked this year. And then that hopefully might balance it out a little bit, or do you think it would just be a total catastrophe and make us suck in stopping the pass? That's the thing. Like it, it, you, the league is so it's such a copycat league, like teams create a blueprint every year on how to be successful. And that, that blueprint changes in my opinion, about every three to five years, 
you could see it kind of turn over because offenses catch on, defenses catch on. When you look at the top three score, the, the goal, I think we would all – can we all agree here for just a second? I want to make sure I'm not completely off base. The goal is to – prevent the other team from scoring points, right? That's still our goal as a defense. I just want to make sure we're on the same page because <laughs> many people are like, oh, scoring defense, that's a BS metric. Get it out of here. It's like, w- so we're tallying up rushing yards to determine who's going to the Super Bowl? Is that what we're doing here? So if if you look at the top scoring defenses, Baltimore, Kansas City, San Francisco, all right, what, what, how do they approach it, Carly, right? That's the question. Um like I said, Baltimore's the number one scoring defense. Kansas City's number two. San Francisco's number three. Passing defense and yards per pass attempt, Baltimore's number one. Kansas City's number two. San Francisco's number five. So you see the common thread there, right? Now, rushing yards per attempt, Baltimore 23rd, Kansas City 25th, San Francisco 17th. So to answer your question, if you see, okay, we're weaker at stopping the run than the pass, let's go get someone who will stop the, the run. And like you suggested, you kind of answered your own question. If the pass defense now takes a step back, you're not following the current blueprint in the NFL to be successful in preventing the other team from scoring points. That makes sense. That's how I see it. I could be wrong. I'm just a fan. I'm no expert, obviously. You can tell by the accent. But that's how I look at it, like ciphering it out and going, okay, how how does this play out? Now, let me give you an example. The fourth best uh, scoring defense in points per play was Tampa Bay. They were 25th at stopping the pass, right? and seventh at stopping the run. So you're going, okay, they had some success doing that, right? But we've seen what happened to Tampa early in the playoffs, right? They got absolutely cooked. Tell you another team that's similar to that, they're not on my rankings. They're not good enough to be on these rankings where I took the basically the one, two, three, four, five, the sixth, uh, you know, the top six scoring defenses. Dallas, another example. What did we do to Dallas? We ran the ball right down their freaking throat, right? Now, Here's the thing. I I don't think this is going to change dramatically in this specific conversation about what's the secret to having a good defense and a good scoring defense specifically. But this thing does – they do change a little bit, right? They do adjust. You know, the the league becomes kind of cyclical. You know, if you you looked at the game last night – let me just pull this up real quick. The 49ers lines. I was looking at the box score. And let's see kind of who had the better game running the ball, right? If you look at – the 49ers, Christian McCaffrey had 20 carries for 90 yards. They averaged four and a half yards a carry, right? David Montgomery for the Lions had 15 carries for 93 yards, okay? So they averaged 6.2 yards a carry. The Lions did, and they lost the game, right? Well, if you go look at the defenses, what makes San Francisco's defense so good? It's not their rush defense. It's their pass defense. They're fifth in yards per pass attempt. So they – People don't want to hear it. I'm trying not to laugh, but it's it's the definition of bend but don't break. And every I just want I just want them to get somebody that helps not make the run game be our kryptonite, right? I want somebody that can help with the run game while not totally turning our past defense game into a disaster. I want to have my cake and eat it too, Clayton. Come on here. I can dream, right? I'll tell you what, I'm I'm with you. God, give me give me top five in every statistical category, Carl. <laughs> Sign me up. I'll take two. What you want is a balanced, well rounded defense is what you're saying. And that's that's the goal and it's constantly an uphill battle when you're trying to do that. Most teams are going to be better at one side than the other. It just it is what yeah. it is. It's, it's tough to be stout uh, against the run and then, you know, lock down, shut down against the pass. It's just, it really, it's tough. Yeah, it is. And, and that's why you've got to pick and choose. You know, you've got to say, okay, like, why did they hire jo- uh, Joe Barry? And why did they, why did they go with the Fangio style system? We talked about it last night. I'm not going to bore y'all with the details again, but, you know, just vaguely, it was stop explosives on both the pass and the run. Let's make this defense, before we make them great, let's make them mediocre. Let's just not be bad. And that's exactly what Joe Barry did. Joe Barry, more sacks, more pressures, all that, right? Their run defense got better. Their pass defense took a slight step back. But like we pointed out, the majority of the explosives came against man coverage. So when when you look at it where the defense is at, now you're bringing someone in to take them from mediocre to top 10. That's the goal, right? Well, we're already a top 10 scoring defense. So what's the next step? It would be pass defense. So who are they interviewing? Christian Parker, right? Bobby Babbage. Bobby Babbage was a DB coach and now a linebacker coach for Buffalo, right? So you're seeing they're kind of gearing it around. That's why the first thing I look for 
if D, if you once you get past your available defensive coordinator pool that you could potentially hire, the next step is passing game coordinator because that's their specialty, stopping the pass. And that's where the league is geared to. Now, how has Goody built this roster? We've talked about this over and over and over, right? We our defensive linemen are pass rush specialists, right? And they they are pretty close to being booty cheeks at stopping the run. They're geared around stopping the pass. That's how our, our roster is built. Quay Walker, why did we choose Quay Walker as a draft pick and try to make him a mock? He's a physical freak. He can cut, he can, he can cover sideline to sideline. The problem is it's not here yet. You see him sitting in space and just allowing guys to catch the ball. And the easy argument all year was Joe Barry told him to do that. I'm sorry. Joe Barry didn't tell him to sit in a space with eight yards free of a defender and go, just stand right there, Quay. Don't don't worry if anyone is in your zone or not. He's not reading and recognizing as quick. The Vondre did that really well two years ago, really well two years ago. Now, is it the injuries? Is it the age? He took a step back. We got to get us a mock in the middle, man. We got to get a mock. That's and I know everybody wants a Fred Warner. It doesn't even have to be Fred Warner. Give me a top ten middle linebacker because Quay isn't that right now, and he may be this year, and I hope he is. I got the autographed jersey right over there on the wall. Love Quay. I think he's got all the tools to be a great uh, linebacker. Here's the other thing, too. Think about Roquan Smith in Chicago. Booty cheeks. Yep. They get rid of him. He goes to Baltimore. Boom, he blows up. Why is that? Good coaching. Did it finally click? He's got the same type of physical talent that Quay Walker has as far as, you know, quickness, and strength, and speed, agility, all those things, right? Um Maybe the right guys always hit their hit their stride a little later than others too. Some guys come in and tear up the league right away, and then some guys it's like, man, you're three. It's like, whoa, yeah, it takes and a huge that's, leap. That's why Johnny Rollins was was like my top pick for DC. Right, mm -hmm. I want to make sure I get the name right here. I've talked about so Johnny Holland. Listen, Holland, I'm yeah, I'm talking about a, of, uh, a baseball Francisco. player. I'm talking about a baseball player from the '80s. There you go, um, Johnny Holland. The reason he was my pick is because like, okay. He was a linebacker coach. He's got 36 years experience in the NFL, including like seven as a player, whatever it was as a player. He's a former Packer, which I didn't know that going in, but he's the most experienced coach on that entire staff in San Francisco. And he's the one who could probably pull the most out of Quay. You add in someone like a Bobby Wagner, someone who's a little more established, has proven, okay, look, he's going to be grading out somewhere in the 70s, according to PFF, or if you look at passer rate. People people hear that and they go, well, that's your problem. You're leaning on PFF. Okay. Yes, Devondre Campbell had a low PFF grade, although he did grade out 65. That was our highest, our highest linebacker. If you go look at passer rating when targeted, 155, worse than the league. That's, that's an issue, right? To me, that's the, the stat that's going to – really judge a player on how well they are, how well they play in coverage when they're targeted. So they were the fifth best uh, passing defense. So I'm hoping that maybe Holland, you know, someone like that. And again, you got the illness too. He's been battling a, an illness. So many people say he's not in the running for DC. Maybe they did reach out and he's like, no, I'm, I'm just not in, in a good enough position to, to pack up my family, move across the country and go coach somewhere else and take on more stress, more responsibility. But, um, Maybe someone like a like I said, like a Chris Hewitt. I just I'm not gonna fake being excited about Christian Parker. I trust I trust the process. And again, I was wrong on Matt LaFleur. I could definitely be wrong on Christian Parker. But when I look at the PFF grades from his position group, when I look at the statistics, their team statistics and scoring, pass defense, all that, there's nothing that says that's the guy, other than he coached two years with Matt LaFleur and Matt LaFleur seems to like to hire people that he gets along with. You know, that's kind of the first and foremost, all right, who would be a good fit for my staff? I hope he comes in and rips it up, man. I really do. It, how cool would it be that if he comes in and completely flips his defense, if he is hired, which, by the way, I don't know, Tim, that report looking a little weird now, ain't it, man? That, uh, the, you know, and, and we really try to cover our bases, and, and I think Andrew was relaying what he heard, and maybe yep. it will still happen, but right now it's kind of like, you sure Everybody. about that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Great. So I don't know, man, but uh, we may get us some uh, some interviews today. Y'all guys got any comment on any of that rambling I just did for about what felt like two and a half hours? Yeah. What the hell's going on out here? <laughs> I love it. Uh,
Let's see. Uh, she said Murph agreed with something, though, Carly. said, Carly took the word right out of my mouth. Great question. Um, probably one of the, yeah, the question you asked earlier. Uh, Drew D says each team has to turn into the league, their organizational structure. Gotcha. So they have to be up front. It's kind of like sharing the tape, right, Drew? Doug Pointer says, I'm just speculating, but wouldn't a single guy with real talent be able to affect rushing yards per attempt, whereas you need several guys to change pass yards per attempt? like a stud linebacker. I think the biggest issue with stopping the run comes from how we draft. You know, we're drafting players. It's it's almost like first and foremost, they're going, okay, how is he in the pass rush? Rather than how do they play the run? And again, I can't argue with it because, you know, you look at across the league, the top scoring defenses, that's what they're keying in on is stopping the pass. So I think it's scheme too, though, right? I mean, if you're going to make an effort to stop the run, you're probably going to drop safeties down into the box, you're probably going to be a little more aggressive yep. with your secondary, um, which, of course. You're going to play less man coverage. Yep. And that that does what? That opens you up over the top. If you're dropping, you know, heavy nickel blitz or you've got safeties playing playing down in the box, you're, you're exposed on the back end. And a, and a good offense will check out of that run and light you up. So, yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Drew D says, I have a feeling tonight we might be talking about our DC hire on PTA. I hope so, Drew. I'm ready to, to get that behind us and start moving forward and looking at, okay, what does this guy bring to the table? I'm, I'm excited about covering the introductory press conference, all that stuff. You know what I mean? You and, sure uh, about that? <laughs> I'm excited to be that fan that tries to fight off the hashtag fire insert name line too, because that stuff drives me absolutely insane, but it's just, and again, you, you look at what, you know, green Bay's defense and, and how we've just been in this endless cycle of higher fire, higher fire, higher fire, higher fire. I think it has a lot to do with how we draft and, um, yep. you know, you, 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 you take a, a combination approach, right? Like you're, you're obviously drafting to stop the pass, right? First and foremost, but then you put all the emphasis on the athletic build, right? The athletic profile. What that screams is someone who is a physical freak, but maybe not as high a football IQ, and they're geared towards stopping one facet of the game. That's how you end up with these situations where guys are just standing in space and not covering people, right? So right. there should be a good balance is all I'm saying. So, But I think you're right, Drew. We might, we might have that this evening. Uh, Andres in the chat said, which team do you think – is a better, well-rounded team, KC or San Francisco? Man, that's a great question. Just on the surface, based off of what we've seen in playoff football, um, what I seen with Kansas City was they played patient. They were willing to take what the defense gave them all day long. It was just dink and dunk, dink and dunk, dink and dunk. You've seen him, uh, Patrick Mahomes, having plenty of time to throw in the pocket. They protected well, right? Uh, you've seen the officials lean toward Kansas City. I don't care what anybody says. Anytime one team has eight penalties and the other has three, that's a bad look on the league, especially seeing that the camera's continuing to shoot up to Taylor Swift in the box. You get what you deserve there, Lee. You're, you're setting yourself up to be criticized and be called, you know, a fixed league. But I can't stand Pat Mahomes, man. I never thought it would get to this point. Did you see him, uh, what he was doing to Justin Tucker before the game? Did you guys see that? That was Kelsey. Kelsey was being the, the no, prick. No, bro, go go watch it. Kelsey did it, and then Pat Mahomes walks over and kicks his oh, tee yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll, I'll tell you what I did see. I did see the whole game. Was it just me? Am I the only one who every single time they did a cut shot to Pat Mahomes, that dude was talking to an official? I mean, it was like the whole game was Pat Mahomes talking to an official. And it's like, dude, like, who are you the head of the officiating crew or are you a quarterback? Like it just boggles my mind. And then you saw a lot of that too. A lot of Kansas city getting away with murder like all night long with the extra stuff after the play. And yeah. then we get, you know, no calls, but then the minute Baltimore breathed on somebody wrong, it's a, you know, 15 yard personal foul. Oh, we got footage. Look at this. Yeah, I love absolutely. it. All right, let me turn the volume down here real quick. So this was, you see Justin Tucker uh, stretching right there, right? He's got his ball set up, and what kickers do is they'll start at the goal line, and they move it back five, move it back five, move it back five, and they're trying to find their, their range, right? So you see Justin Tucker there. Now you see Pat Mahomes warming up. First you'll see Kelsey come in. I think this is the whole video. Oh, right? okay. So now I was let, 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 see Kelsey. Kelsey throwing his helmet, his balls, everything out of the way. We're warming up right here, right? So watch Justin Tucker, okay? There's another video. I need to find it because there's a video – where Justin Tucker goes to kick. So that's the one you've seen, Tim. Let me see. Yeah, if that's the one I saw. 
Yeah. And it's important to remember, too, that both teams, yeah, you have your sides of the field or whatever. Everyone has equal rights to warm up on that field pregame, right. if I'm not mistaken. Right. So. No, absolutely, man. And it's like who was there first, too, is the thing. You know, right. it's just, and it, I don't know. It, that bothered me. Let me see if I could find the one because he walks over and kicks the tee down, too. Um, if I could find A lot of respect for that. Justin Tucker handling that like a total pro. He's just kind of laughing it off. Oh, yeah, he definitely was. Yeah, here, here's a good one right here. So he grabs his tee back, goes picks his stuff back up, right? I'm going to share it here real quick with you guys. Um, he goes and picks his tee back up, sets it up, and now watch Pat Mahomes. So it wasn't just him. It wasn't just uh, our boy Kelsey. Let me get zoomed in here. So now you see Kelsey's out there running routes and stuff, right? I'm, I'm assuming, right? Now watch right here. See Pat kick it? Yeah. Look, he's getting ready to kick his extra point. Pat kicked his tee down. It looked, I want to. I want to use a word that I can't use oh, on the show right now, but I. I, I think you, you know where I'm going. Yeah, and then look, he just walks over to him, smacks him in the chest, and look, Kelsey's saying, he's, Kelsey's talking crap, but won't look at him. Right now, look, here, here he goes. He's trying to set it up again. Right. So look, he sets it up one more time. And look, Pat. Yeah. This. That's just crazy, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> That that dude, where where the heck are the other Ravens? Right, right. Where where are his teammates? Because like you come into my building in a playoff game, mm -hmm. championship game, and start pulling that crap. Yeah, and you it's know, not I'd like to have some guys you know backing me up over there. There's Justin Tucker on an island by himself. And it's not like Pat Mahomes had to throw from that exact spot either. You know what I mean? It's like I don't. Know, it's just a bad look, man. Bad look. What were you gonna say, Carla? No, it just it cracks me up seeing this sort of stuff in professional football, like the little head games and this stuff. I think it's I just think it's really entertaining. Yeah, so you all. like it. You don't have a problem with it. I mean, it's I think it's yeah, I think I think there's probably a little bit of attitude going on both sides. I mean, he does go and set right in the middle of them to to kick and that's kind of inviting it. And then they're doing that. It's yeah, I think it's that, I mean, they're they're grown ups. They can they can do that. I don't think it's that big a deal. Gotcha. And that's that's the big question, too, right? Who was there first? Or like like middle schoolers. I was here first. Who was actually there first? Um, Pat Mahomes just I he just rubs me the wrong way. He when when they got the roughing call, I think it should have been called roughing, but the way he flails when he goes down, throws his arms around and everything. Oh, uh, go back. I need to go back to my tweet from last year. Remember when they played the Bengals and he got the roughing call out out of bounds? And it's like he gets shoved out of bounds, and he goes completely limp and throws himself into the bench. And it's just like, get away from me with that crap, dude. Yeah. I, I, maybe I've watched too many old NFL films of Ray Nitschke and Jack Lambert and Bart Starr and these guys that were just – they had too much pride to flop like that. And we laughed about Zach Tom earlier this year going completely parallel when he got shoved down, right? It's yeah, like – me as a player, I just couldn't bring myself to do that, man. I couldn't. I've yeah, got too I much pride. I don't think guys like Mahomie would last very long in that era of football, honestly. Oh, no. you, you can get up off the turf and look around at the refs and cry for a roughing the passer call all you want. You weren't getting it. <laughs> Back to Andres' question. <laughs> we got way off track. Which team do you think is a better, well-rounded team, Casey or San Francisco? When we, I don't know if we actually answered your question. When you kind of look at how they're built, for me, it's it's probably I hate to say it, but it, it is probably Kansas City. Um, Kansas City is one of those teams. I hate to I hate to say this because I'll be honest. After seeing that stuff with Kansas City, I'm probably pulling for San Francisco. To be honest with you, like I'm not really going to be pulling for anyone, but I just want to see Mahomes fall flat on his face after that crap, and after yeah. all the, just the the sideshow stuff this year, and and uh, I don't know, man. Just, it just I just look at it this way. I'm if I'm going to cheer at all. I'll just say it's the NFC against the AFC. So I'll roll with my with the NFC in this Super Bowl. We'll just leave the teams and the specifics out of it because I can't stand either one of them. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, I would think Kansas City is the the more well-rounded team. Let me ask you this. Which coach are you taking? Andy, Andy Reid. Reed or Kyle Shanahan? Andy Reid 100% of the time. Which quarterback are you taking? You got one game to win. Brock Purdy or Pat Mahomes? I'm going Pat taking Mahomes. Up. Taking that little, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I'm going that. Pat Mahomes. Um, and then when you go to edge defenders, who's got the better edge defenders, right? You got you got Chris Jones who can move around all around the defensive line for Kansas City. But San Francisco, you've got Bosa, right? 
So that's really close. I may lean toward Bosa. Two out of the three, I'm probably going Kansas City. What do you think, Carly? Which one do you think is the better team there, Kansas City or San Francisco? Oh, better probably Kansas City. I feel like, yeah, with the coaching and just both sides of the ball, but I'm really rooting for Purdy because I like his story. I do too. I really do. Uh, and he he seems really humble too. That's what I like about him. One side, you got a guy that's doing this. I know you don't just, it's funny that <laughs> you don't disagree with it, but uh, you know, the kicking of the tee, just the cockiness and all the commercials and it's just uh, the flopping. I look at Brock Purdy and I'm like, that dude just does whatever he's got to do to help his team win. You know um, what do you think, Tim? I guess you chose it. Yeah. I, I definitely Kansas city probably okay, as, yeah, gotcha. as much as that pains me to, to say, all right. um, but I can tell you this, if they try that, those antics, you know, before the Super Bowl, there's going to be there's going to be fights prior to the game because the 49ers, they're not going to put up with that crap. You come right. over and start messing with our guys, you know, especially yeah. after seeing that. It's not like it's a secret now, but I'm sure the guys that have dealt with this, you know, they they know what it's like when when you're playing against the Chiefs and, you know, yeah. everything that comes with that circus of the, uh, you know, the Kelsey and Mahomes circus that comes to town all the time. So. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I leave my kickers alone out there, though. Jeez, man. And I'll kick the bloody piss out of it. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely <laughs> love it. I'm sure Paul's got something good for us here in a second. All right, let's wrap up in the chat real quick. God, I just dropped one down. I was going to hit. It's lost forever. I apologize for whoever that was. I wish I could rewind the stream. Anyway, <laughs> Prince in the chat says, can they interview in secret and release names to throw off possible competitors for DCs? Kind of like what goes on around the draft. Like we said, that all that stuff, the league is very, very strict on having to release and be completely transparent with each other because it creates more competitive balance, which I agree with. So um, Prince says, Mahomes grew up playing football, not football, where flopping is an art form. Did he really play soccer? I didn't know that. I thought he was a baseball player. And he definitely played baseball. That's the other thing, too, that's hard for me to kind of stomach is he grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth. His dad was a professional athlete. His his wife has pretty much annoyed everyone. Um, I don't know. It's just it's just a hard sell for me. Doug uh, in the chat says, Forrest Gregg and Mike Dick had a, p- a pregame brawl in the hallway adjoining their locker rooms at Soldier Field back in the 80s. I remember them talking about going to meet after the game, too, like the whole team and the coaching staff. They were like, yeah, we're just going to we'll, – We'll just meet out here in the parking lot after it's over. Like, imagine – I just can't imagine Pat Mahomes going on the field with some of those folks from the 80s and the and the 70s. I'd pay to see it, though, if it was possible. Oh, God. I'd <laughs> sign me up, boy. Um, a fam in the chat said, if Purdy wins, Taylor Swift might be like, mm, who's this Purdy guy? I'll leave Kelsey. There you go. That'd be- Roadhouse. To the side. All right, we're off the rails. We're talking. Taylor Swift is into the chat, so we are. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. Let's go around the horn one time here, Carly. What else you got? Anything else you want to cover? Anything else? Uh, any comments on what we just talked about? So I have it. It's not really a conspiracy theory, but this thoughts on why Kelsey has just kind of played so bad all year. And I have followed it because he was my first round pick in my fantasy league, who then ended up just being cheeks and causing me to not win money. Anyway, so I think this relationship, yeah, this relationship with Swift, I think he's been overall the season probably partying a little bit too much and taking it a little too easy. I think this end of the season, he's really focused a lot more and I think so I'm kind of making a prediction I think he's going to come out and have one of his best game in the Super Bowl I think that they're going to win and I think he might choose then to retire and be done and retire with his brother enter Canton with his brother I think that might be if he wins I think that might be coming I could see that I could see that and then she dump him in the off season. And he wants to get back in football, right? That would happen. Too. And then he write, and then he writes. She writes her next album all about football and dating a football <laughs> player and all the heartache that comes with it, and it ends up being a bestseller or a top top hit. Uh, Carly, you you've read the script. Somebody gave you the script for next year, didn't they? Somebody <laughs> gave you the script. I love. It. Look at this right here. Doug <laughs> says, "Swifty Swifty fan total access. Order your merch now." <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely Listen, not. By the way, you sure about that? You sure about that? We got bad news you on the merch. Sure store. About that? Um, we got some items taken down again, so I don't know what else to do. Evidently, you're not allowed to put anything on a shirt nowadays. I think what it has to do is the site we're using is really strict, and that's a good thing. But the Packer fan total access stuff should be good to go. But 
I'm thinking now we're not allowed to use the word diesel because that is a clothing line. So we can't put diesel on anything. Right. Um, which is absolutely wild. You're not allowed to put, I guess you can't use gas either. I don't know. But anyway, um, we're adjusting some stuff. So hopefully we'll get it straightened out um, where you guys can order some merch because there's been several orders placed and you're going to get refunded for it. Now, if you did the Packer fan total access uh, shirt, whatever, that should be good to go. Um, I tried to order a mug yesterday that said Green Bay football on it, right? Uh, or no, it said diesel on it too, but there was another one too. Green Bay football, I think it got canceled as well. But we gotta, I got to call them and see exactly which part of this order got canceled because I ordered a ton of merch so we could give it away. And uh, they just don't like us being nice to listeners, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, there you go. So try lowercase, Jen said. Hey, all right. Yeah, we can do that. We'll figure it out. We'll get you guys some merch for sure, though. Like I said, there should be a couple of items that are still up, and we'll try to work out the kinks. But anyway, we appreciate y'all wanting to support the stream. Y'all are trying really, really hard. But, uh, yeah, capitalism is uh, is attacking here with full force. But, Tim, you got anything else? Buddy? <laughs> uh, no, no, I can't. My head hurts just thinking about what we just talked about with Kansas City. I'm sorry. I'm just my having an aneurysm right now i really i really hope they do like just one more for andy reed swan song the last hurrah and then we can just watch that you know organization slowly demise i'm over it <laughs> absolutely over it that's awesome. those calls I'm boggling. it's the no calls that got me like i get okay you know look there was some stupid stuff that baltimore did but some of the no calls on Kansas City dragging receivers to the ground, the interception in the in the end zone, I don't I don't think it's the reason the ball was intercepted. It was a stupid throw in a triple coverage. But you got a defender, the ball's five yards away, and you got a defender running through the receiver with his back to the ball. It's just like, how do you? This looks bad. This looks really bad on the league. Really bad. So anyway, there you go. We hit conspiracies. We hit coaching changes. I'm with Drew. I think that we. <laughs> Look at Prince. It's hilarious. I think that um, we may be talking about a DC hire as early as tonight, unless they got their eyes on someone on San Francisco or Kansas City. That could be the case too. But Prince in the chat said Kelsey Twins, WWE tag team champions in 2026. I wouldn't doubt it one bit. So AFAM says, Tim, hate to tell you, buddy, but the Chiefs aren't going anywhere, unfortunately. So yeah, it's going to be a while, I believe. Uh <laughs> you yeah. sure about that? What was what was Jen's idea, Carly? I missed it. Oh, she said try using um the money sign for the for the S in diesel. Gotcha. Okay. We may do that then. Look at Jen. I like Jen. Jen's a rule breaker. Who the know. hell is still wearing people still wear diesel clothing? I'm sorry. Yes, Jen, they do. <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> I haven't seen anybody. <laughs> I haven't either. I haven't either. I don't know. I'm not up on fashion, though, as you guys can tell. Yeah, I, go, I go back and forth. I, I get it's it's amazing how many men, grown men, have commented on my hair. It's really weird, to be honest with you. But uh, <laughs> Also, I get told by my wife that, like, here, just wear this. You don't know what the hell you're doing. Put this on, please. You look like a bum. So, uh, you know, I know it's hard to believe seeing that every episode we do, I'm wearing a hoodie. But, you know, you know how it is. And, of course, we don't have the... Uh, we don't roll with the narcissist cam either, do we, Tim? Let's get them with the narcissist cam real quick, right? You ready for this? Let's do it. Nope, that ain't even it. We got to get it. Oh, there Here it is. is. <laughs> People that podcast like that, actually, I don't know how they do it, man. I'm I'm a nervous wreck just being on screen. I want to kill the camera, but I got roasted for not having a camera active. But I do, yeah. Tim, Tim will comment all the time. He's like, there's the narcissist cam. Like, let me get my entire face on the screen if possible. A fam says. Uh -huh. <laughs> Who in their right mind extends the ball like that? What was he talking about? Extends the ball like that. Was he Talk talking about the play where Flowers got it knocked out of the uh, oh, knocked gotcha. out of his hand because he tried to make the play, the touchdown? Yeah. You know, I'm sitting on my couch having a daddy soda, about I don't know, 20 pounds overweight. And I'm going, how do you not hold that thing in here like this, Tim? Why not why not dive like this? Why are you you know, I'm over here judging a player for extending the ball? But it is a bad <laughs> look, man. They're trying to coach it out of the league because it's and, and I know there's some people that are like, they need to change the rule. I completely disagree with that. Completely disagree with that. You got to protect the football, man. Yep. In that situation. The game gets to the point where, well, let's don't, let's put the possessing the football on the back burner. I think we're losing our sport. So anyway. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Andre said, put your, put your face on the back. 
<laughs> have like have one of those images where it's my face over my face over my face over my face. So it's like <laughs> going off in the distance. God, I would lose my mind. You'd never see me podcast again. Anyway, we're out of here. Appreciate you guys. This was a lot of fun. You know it's time to go when uh, when Margin Cron says affliction total access. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, everybody, thank y'all so much for your time. This was a lot of fun. Want to give a special shout out to Mace Taggart. Thank you for the super chat, buddy. We appreciate you supporting the stream, Tim Carly. This was a blast. We will uh, be back tonight for Packers Total Access Live. Hopefully, we have some coaching news. Um, that would be cool if we made a hire. Although I wouldn't be surprised if it drags into next week. But if a couple of these head coaching, if these final two head coaching vacancies get filled somehow, some way, some of the OCs and DCs fall into place, then we might, that might accelerate the process. And who knows, we maybe get an answer this evening. So uh, really appreciate y'all. Listen, re- thank you guys so much for trying to support the stream and, and purchase the merch. Like you guys are awesome. And I know you guys just want to rep the brand, if you will. Um, but uh I, I really, it means the world to us. We're going to try to get it straightened out. Um, and if you did place an order, you're going to get refunded. If it was an item that, that did get kind of, uh, didn't get approved. I just want to make sure you guys and gals know how much we appreciate you. Y'all, you've been just unbelievable to us and it's been so much fun creating this thing. And we're going to have to adjust stuff as we go. It's just a part of it. It goes with it. Like, you know, the podcast will be named Packer fan total access just to make sure we're not doing anything wrong. That type of thing. There may be a limit on certain images we can use. We'll adjust as we go. Please don't think it's us trying to quote unquote sell out or change what we're doing. It's just uh, we want to make sure we're doing right by the Packers too. And I'm in direct communication with them, trying to make sure that we're covering all the bases and that type of thing. So uh, first and foremost, we want to support our favorite team. That's that's at the top of the list. So thank you all for hanging out with us. Thank you for your support. We will see you guys tonight. For those of you listening on the pod, thank you for making us a part of your day. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And go Pack Go! Go!